That's the interesting thing about artists working with labels is like they sell you on, you have this team, this individual team, but what they don't tell you is that everybody there is working on a hundred other things at the mm -hmm. same time. So like you are like, oh, I got a marketer, I got an A&R, but then that marketer got 50 other artists on this roster. So you might realistically get 30 minutes of that person's time and work yeah. out the whole week. The record labels and an issue with the business model I was just talking about, and many of y'all might not actually have had one of these scenarios. Um, happen to you or know of these uh, scenarios. But a lot of times you have these A&Rs, if you will, or just middlemen, if you will, mm -hmm. that will, you will build up artists and send them over to the labels, right? Yeah. And it sounds like a great deal. It's like, hey, a little Corey, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to get you popping. And now that you're popping, I've built your market value and I can sell you off to the labels. Yeah. But here's the real issue that happens a lot of times. You have somebody who works with an artist, helps build them up, sells them off to the label, but you get rid of one of the most valuable parts of that artist or their path and their blow up because that person who was really integral in blowing them up sold them off to the label and now the label doesn't necessarily know what to do with them. And sometimes, a lot of times, the artist doesn't know what to do with themselves because that person was way more integral than the artist thought. Mm -hmm. Right, that'd be the, that'd be the big. One. <laughs> That's the thing, and then the label <laughs> is like you're investing in like half of a business because mm -hmm. that goes into underappreciating the value. Let's just say this marketer, a r a n r, whoever who leveraged their resources and maybe even like directed the artist, told them what to do throughout certain scenarios, and now you're just left with the artist, and it's bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right, labels like oh man, I don't know what to do with this. Next thing you know, you know, well we'll, we'll just drop them. We'll just consider that one of the L's. So there should be in every other industry, well, most industries that I know of, they have a clause when they buy a business, they try to negotiate something where you have to stay on for a year or two. There's a transition period before you can leave because we don't want all of a sudden the company to just blow up. Everybody say, hey, we were loyal to Corey or, or there's too much IP of why things were working and we need to make sure the transition is smooth, right? Mm -hmm. That same thing exists with these artists. And I feel like people don't acknowledge that en enough. If an artist starts taking off and there's people around them, don't just allow that. I mean, I don't know who that's worse for, the record label side or the artist. Because at least the artist got in a better position. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now they're signed. Well, could, but then they are got in a better position for a moment in time. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. It's, it's right? temporary. Temporary good position. Temporary. <laughs> but now you're like just flailing in this label, unacknowledged. Nobody knows what to do with you. The vision that got you there is not longer uh, than the person who was selling you to other people. Yeah. That's another part. They just helped you and sold you to another organization. That means not... It's not just about selling you to the label. You still need that selling ability and understanding how to pitch you ability throughout everything you're doing as an artist. Because a great manager is always pitching you to like playlist or well, people they know around playlist. Sometimes it's directly a playlist, sponsors, booking agents, whoever. Right? You always need somebody who has the ability to pitch you. And if you just get passed off, and you know, needless to say, some of these artists managers are not necessarily that one that got them there yeah see i think that's where it gets lost right because there are those positions that have i think seen that and figure out ways to bake themselves in typically i see it being managers and a and r's like managers and a and r's are find a way to stay attached to the, the situation right some of them some of them yeah good point because you got them. some of these guys who are like all right i'm gonna pass you off and i'm gonna get a managerial fee, even though I'm not even going to be involved. Yeah, or the A&R that's like, I'm going to pass you off. I'm on to the next hot hot guy just on. Right. right. I gotta, yeah. I'm trying to build like, another business yeah, and exactly. sell it off. Yeah. Buy and sell yeah. is my entire way of moving. They flipping. Man, but it, cause I, I do feel like what's so hard, what's hard about that is like it's, it's hard sometimes to like quantify who was actually impactful in yep. the blow up until – to your point, you can kind of step back and look at the... Now that the process is over with, you can analyze it more clearly. Yep. And then you start to see, like, damn, bro, that, that videographer I hired, like, I'm really seeing, like, people saying they missed the old look of my videos and I'm realizing that dude I got rid of to go get, you know what I'm saying, Hype Williams or some shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, that right, shit. I'm paying that 10x shit. the amount of money <laughs> but, and but, then people but, not messing with it. Yeah, exactly, but 0.5x the results. So I, I, I do think that's... That's one of the issues, like especially when the artist is blowing. It's like shit be moving so fast, like it's so hard to like 
sit down and analyze. We've been in that position, man. How many times have we been, you know, work with a nice little bright-eyed, you know, indie artist? You know, they pop off, label come scoop them up. They're like, all right, we're going to, you know, throw you to the label marketing team. We're like, all right, bro, you know, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun working with you while it lasted. Hopefully we see you back in another yeah. three, four months. Not for, you know, for, for good reasons, but, like, we've been in that position where it's yeah. like, man, you know, I get it. It's going to be hard for you to fight for the marketing team, yeah. but you need us. You know what I'm saying? Because right. we've already done the research. To your point, I think, too, it's like, man, we spent, like, there have been clients where we spent two years just talking to them to understand them enough mm. to give yeah. them even a, a inkling of success. And then, to your point, they never get passed off to this group of people that not only have to learn them, but they have to also learn them while figuring out how to keep the momentum going and keep growing them. It's a hard thing to do. You know what I'm saying? While they're also handling other artists. Yeah, exactly. While out and a lot of other artists too. You know, when you talk about against that level, so it's like, yep. uh, man, I was just telling somebody that man. I had a conversation with another client off line, and I was saying like, that's the interesting thing about I think artists working with labels is like they sell you on. You have this team, this individual team, but what they don't tell you is that everybody there is working on a hundred other things at the mm-hmm. same time. So like you are like, oh, I got a marketer, I got an A and R, but then that marketer got fifty other artists on his roster. So you might realistically get thirty minutes of that person's time and work yeah. out the whole week, you know. And then people look at us like, oh, y'all expensive. It's like yeah, but we only working with like fifteen people, man. So you know, more expensive, but more time. So yeah, I I do more get it. Attention, hands on. I do get it, man. It's, and we only work with 15 people no more. You get that out there. Don't put that in the universe. Oh, you're right. My bad, y'all. A lot. Don't listen to that. <laughs> like about five max. And I think, too, it has to do with just, like, like how do you quantify? Because to your point, right, like, if I'm an artist, let's say I've, I've somehow looked up and I got eight people helping me with different things, yeah. right? When I pop... Or when I have a big moment, all eight of them are going to evenly feel like their contribution is what helped me get here. The booking that is going to feel like, yo, me getting you on that open and set up rolling loud really pushed you a long way, right? The yeah. marketer is going to feel like, hey, me optimizing those ads and getting those five or six influence posts really helped you out. Mm. The a and is going to be like, yo, me help connecting you with that one producer really helped you out. So then how do you as an artist or a person that's a core part of the artist team accurately assess whose contributions really were what helped you go. Because there's an argument made that all of them, all of their contributions are the reason you're here. So should all of them make a case to, you know, be sunsetted in, you know? Or do you mm-hmm. step back and go like, all right, eight of you were impactful. Maybe, maybe all, maybe, uh, yeah, eight of you all contributed, you know, well, eight of you were impactful. Six of you only contributed 10%. These other two contributed 20% a piece, right? And so I'm, <laughs> I'm taking these two with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, how do you quantify that? Yeah, it requires discernment for sure. I think it's understanding, for one, the artists themselves, all right? So it's going to be a little subjective, but and also the fan base is like, what seems to be most important to the fans, Mm -hmm. all right? And how can I control that? It's like when you think about a marketing department these days, the best marketing departments for for companies are in-house because they understand the brand, the taste, you know, all of that so they can better communicate that and they can keep things consistent, which leads to more impact. So if you have like this consistent videographer where your artist has a good rapport and you're like, oh yeah, my artist like is comfortable with this person so they have better videos as a result, mm-hmm. right? You pay attention to those things and I think that's especially important for maybe a manager to pay, uh, to pay attention to. Um, or you know that... Well, I think the videographer thing is 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 easier to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Who else would be on the team? You can get you can get fan feedback on that, right? You know what I'm saying, yeah. Marketer, then you'll just be like, does this marketer tend to understand what's going on mm-hmm. with this artist? Like, do they just seem to see the vision? They come up with really great narratives. They seem to mm-hmm. get the artist pitch ideas that have a high percentage of the artist actually liking. Versus, you know, because, you, you know, we could throw out plenty of ideas and the artist just doesn't stick. Yeah. Right. So I think it's just judging those little things based on what someone's doing first. Um, like not even among all eight people. Let's just say if there's eight people around the artist that they've worked with over time. Just first of all, like 
what's their quality of impact based on what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah. and once you get that baseline, then you see is there like so are they top level that? Then you start to gauge like all right, do they go beyond that somehow? Do they creep into other areas where you know like us? Yeah, we can do ads for people or something like that, but then and we can pitch some ideas to go around a song, but we also do like creative direction or mindset you know I mean? shifts. Mindset shifts. Yeah, yeah, we 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 coaching and things like that. Yeah. Like I mean, I will literally have this one guy. You know, I'm telling him the exact angles. It's like, no, you need to be closer up when you shoot this shot for this video. And then this happens and that needs to happen. And then he'll shoot a video and then we'll make some adjustments on how to come back. Like, those are like smaller details. And then, but you have to also probably have some context of what another me looks like. Because if mm -hmm. you're not comparing me to anybody mm -hmm. or don't know, because I think that's a lot of times some people... Let's just say we're us. We'll talk ourselves up for a second. Yeah. All right. If we're their first experience, they don't know who to like the context of like, oh, other marketers might not know X, Y, and Z. Man. Right. Or do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Right. Um, and we pride ourselves on like really staying on the cutting edge. Well, and I think part of it is just because we've had to. Right. So we've just trained to look at everything mm -hmm. differently. So I think yeah, it's one impact on fans and like what is that? Is there a synergy there? In terms of like what this person is doing is having a high impact on the fans. Two, is there a synergy with the artists that things just seem to click, right? Uh, three, of course, and not this is not in any particular order. Do they do the job that they're supposed to do at a high level? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you don't, let's just say hey, man, I sucked at running ass. I'm supposed to be the ass guy. I've sucked at running ass, and I'm not really good at getting influencers like that. Mm -hmm. But, boy, I'm really coaching and getting the artists in their bag and pitching these ideas. Then you say, all right, well, how can I get him off of those things? But I still understand his impact enough that he needs to be here. And that's the difference between great coaches in sports, right? Yeah. They understand their pieces. Phil Jackson, when Dennis Rodman say, yo, bro, can I go to Vegas? And we in the middle of the playoffs. And he said, yeah, go ahead, because he know that Dennis Rodman got to get his thing going, and he's going to be good. But if I was playing, I would not be able to go to Vegas and come out <laughs> like moving like Dennis. Most people can't do that, but, he had, yeah. but you understand that he psychologically has a different way of moving. So I guess that all that to say is, you know, pay attention to your people and pay attention for them and then pay attention to the, the team collective as a whole because that really what it is. It's, it's, it's team psychology. All right, so I want to give a reminder that being independent is not just about not being signed to a label. It's actually making money without being signed to a label, being able to have a sustainable career. And for those of y'all who actually want to be able to make money from your fan base, you're serious about figuring out how to monetize. I have a free video that you can check out. I don't need your email. I don't need your phone number. I don't need any information. All you have to do is go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. And I'm going to show you the lies that artists have been told that have been keeping them, probably you too, from monetizing your fan base and how shifting that perspective has allowed one artist we're working with to be on track to make over $500,000 this year. This is a different era. Don't fall for that trap saying artists can't make money. Artists do not have to be broke. So if you want to escape that trap, go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. You do have to make sure you put the www in the beginning when you type it in your URL and watch this free video again. You're not going to be asked to put in your email. You're not going to be asked for your phone number, but it won't be up forever. Check it out. It's crazy because now that I think about it, it, it ties back to the bigger narrative of labels don't like to develop talent. And I mm -hmm. think we tend to think about that musically. But then what I'm hearing in your point is like it also applies to just the back end talent of the artist, right? Because to your point, yeah. right, like the, that marketer that maybe sucks at running ads, but he's he or she is really good at getting the artist out of the comfort zone with the content, and maybe that's been what's make, been making the ad swing. The ad setup has been shitty, but he's been coaching him through some good ideas, so it worked out. The easy way would be okay, yeah, we're gonna just replace you with an, an ad person. I think the better way would be like, all right. Let us help you get better at this thing so we can keep you here because then everybody wins. Then. So we don't have to like mess up the flow of this operation. You get a level or two better, which like if you were doing great 
with a shitty skill set, imagine how amazing you're going to be once the skill set is sharpened, right? Mm, now, I know yeah. this, this is an easier one. Like, we're talking about ads, which is an easier skill set to sharpen like that. But from what I've seen, yeah, most of them are not doing that. <laughs> They're not going to do that. It's a time thing. Like, you know, yeah. like, I... I know, I know a person that got a job at a label, and like they were basically talking about it. Like when they got the job, they were just kind of thrown into the fire. Like there was no real like training period. There was mm -hmm. no real. It wasn't like an orientation period where they like, oh, this is the right way to kind of do things. They just had to come in, you know, pay attention, listen, and pick up, and then just get into get into flow, right? Because you look at it, it's a hundred people with a hundred things to do every day. Nobody has time to stop you and go like, yo, like this is the way we send emails. This is the way we, right? And then they might teach you as you fuck up. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. how they train you. It's like, oh, you messed this up. Don't do not do that. This is the right way to do it. But they're not, like, formally sitting down. Like, when we hire, like, Mark and stuff, like, we put them through, like, a training period. You know what I'm saying? We're like, all right, we're going to you, – you hop on the call with me and Sean, you know what I'm saying, like, two or three times a week, you know what I'm saying, every week for, like, the next three weeks. And then, and then we throwing you into the fire. I don't think – yeah, I, I, won't, I won't say every label isn't doing it, but I would argue most of them aren't doing that. You know what I'm saying? But then – you look at it and it's like you look at the artist as this dominant in the rough that needs to be developed. Most artists aren't getting picked up out of obscurity. They've more than likely built some type of a team around them. And what I think labels do fuck up at is they go like, how can I replace these people around you rather than how can I just insert people into this operation you've already mm -hmm. built and give you resources to make your team stronger, which I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm built different, but that's what I would do because I'd be looking like, oh, you already got an ad guy? Great, we can save some money on our side. You know what I'm saying? And not <laughs> you already got an ad guy, and he already expecting to eat off of your top line. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. this is beautiful, bro. Like, yeah, what he need? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, <laughs> that's the you know, and that's where the conflict <laughs> of labels comes in when they have all these bureaucratic corporate initiatives or the way they're trying to save money and get things going, done that prevent them sometimes of from doing what's best for an artist because mm -hmm. really it's easier and it's less work even on you individually. Yeah. But then, you know, a label might be like, well, I want all this ad data or, you know, mm -hmm. we've talked about. We don't trust your homie yeah. with the with the, the budget. How right. we know he going to spend the whole 10K? Like all these different things. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and they'll throw stuff out like that to hide their real reasons. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that's a good angle I'm going to come at, but I really I just – don't want to give it over yeah. and then you got those opportunities like uh like you talked about the i mean even we've got these opportunities we just don't use them i just thought about it you know the um the free money we'll get from the ad programs and stuff uh, like yeah. that yeah yeah like, like the, the gratis yeah 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 Wow, what's up? It's Brain Man Sean. And if you like this clip, you can listen to the full episode on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you stream your podcast. But if you want to keep watching, we've placed a video that will be so useful for you conveniently above. Go ahead and click that link and watch it.